I would like to welcome you to our series called Altar Call. This is a companion to my book by the same name, in which I trace the sanctuary theme through the Bible so that we can better understand how Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice and through his ministry for us, his mediation in heaven, is working out our salvation so that we can be restored in the end. How do we get in touch with Jesus where he is now? This is the heart cry of our age. So as we begin, let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, we're so grateful that you have made for us a place of sanctuary. As we talk about this place that you had for the Israelites, we remember that you are there in your heavenly sanctuary now, and you always have a place of sanctuary for us. You invite us there by faith. As we learn and as we open your word to get in touch with Jesus where he is now, may your Holy Spirit be with us and direct us and give us wisdom and insight. In Jesus' name, amen. So our first presentation is called A Place of Sanctuary. And I would like to begin at the beginning, which Julie Andrews said was a very good place to start. In the very beginning in the Bible, according to the book of Genesis, the world was perfect. There was no death, no pain, no suffering. Everything was magnificent. But tragically, Adam and Eve chose to break God's law of love by listening to a deceiver, by ungratefully violating and ignoring his warning. So as a result, Adam and Eve and the whole human race, their descendants, became mortal, subject to sin. Not only that, and just as tragically, they lost their ability to be in God's presence. Because God's presence would destroy them. They were now sinful and mortal. And his glory is like a consuming fire. So they were separated from God, and that pained him just as much as it pained them. What was he going to do? What were they going to do? Well, the solution shows up in the book of Exodus. And in Exodus 25, verse 8, God commands Moses to have his chosen people, the Israelites, who were the channel of his revelation in the world, these words... Exodus 25, verse 8, And let them build me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them. A place for God to be with them. That's what he wanted all along. That's why he created human beings, to be one with them, his children. In the very end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, God wants to restore again his dwelling with human beings. Without a sanctuary, with his full unveiled glory, but for the Israelites, he put a place of controlled interaction where he could meet with them as close as he could get to them without destroying them. And at this place, he would dwell among them, be a place of sanctuary, protection, guidance. They would be safe with him. This sanctuary, according to the next verse, Exodus 25, verse 9, was to be made according to a pattern. And God said, in accordance with all that I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all the furniture, so you shall make it. A pattern of what? The book of Hebrews in the New Testament tells us what the pattern was all about. In the New Testament, in Hebrews 8 verse 5, it explains that this pattern was of a reality that was already in existence in heaven. This verse, Hebrews 8, verse 5, says, They offer worship in a sanctuary that is a sketch and shadow of the heavenly one. For Moses, when he was about to erect the tent, was warned, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. So you see, the earthly sanctuary mirrored the heavenly sanctuary. This was a place for God to have a place of dwelling, a residence on the earth. And furthermore, according to Hebrews 8, verse 6, the very next verse, it says, But Jesus has now obtained a more excellent ministry, and to that degree he is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted through better promises. So in the heavenly sanctuary right now, Jesus Christ is carrying out the reality to which those prophetic, symbolic rituals in the Old Testament sanctuary were pointing forward. So not only could the Israelites gain benefit by getting as close to God as they could, we can learn from their interactions with him. And we can realize and have faith that whereas they had earthly, mortal, sinful high priests, 
and priests, we have the sinless, divine, pure, immortal high priest, Jesus Christ, working for us in the sanctuary in heaven. That's very exciting. Now let's learn a little bit more about this ancient Israelite sanctuary, because as we do so, we will learn more about how God interacts with us now through Christ in his heavenly sanctuary. The Israelites were moving, as you recall, from Egypt, where God had set them free from Pharaoh, through the wilderness to Canaan, the promised land, which they were going to take. There in the wilderness, as you can see from this picture, there was the Israelite sanctuary at the heart of the camp. And this was in a hollow square with all of the tents of the tribes of Israel around about the sanctuary, with the tents of the Levites and the priests forming a cordon around the sanctuary closest to it. This whole configuration with a hollow square and the sanctuary, the residence, the palace of the God King in the middle was like a picture that archaeologists have found in Egypt. A picture of the war camp of Pharaoh Ramses II with the tents of the Egyptians and a hollow square with the tent of the Pharaoh, the human God King, they thought, in the middle. But this was really God dwelling in the midst of the Israelites. And you can see that that cloud hovering above the sanctuary was his glory cloud. That's where his presence resided, hovering above the ark of the cherubim and, and its cherubim. This was the enthronement of God living among his people. As we go to the next slide, we see this dwelling place of God. It was his palace. Now, a very modest one, of course, because it had to be transported from place to place. And so it was made so that it could be taken apart. But nevertheless, it was the human res residence, the earthly residence, not of an ordinary human being, but the residence among human beings of the God King, the very Shekinah. The problem with idolatry, with putting an image in a sanctuary like this, was that it would displace the real presence of God with his people. He was really there. They didn't need any idol or any image to represent him. Now, as we look at the sanctuary, we see that there's a courtyard around the outside. And these pictures have various sorts of depictions. These are just artist reconstructions. Some show a pitched roof. The roof probably was not pitched. It was probably flat, as you see in this one. You can see that there was a courtyard around about just as you would expect around the palace of an earthly king. And as we look inside, you can see that it had two apartments. There was the living room outside, which had a table for food, bread in this case, and lights, and an incense burner. Because in the ancient times, the uh, wealthy people or kings would have incense burning when they had their mealtime in order to drown out the ubiquitous... Uh, ever-present stench of the su surrounding communities, because you recall that they used donkeys for transportation and all these things. If you've been to a country where they do that, you know what I'm talking about. So that was the living room outside. But then inside the smaller room, there was the very special throne room. There was a box made of acacia wood, covered with gold, with cherubim, that is, guardian angel figures above it. The golden slab on top of that ark is often translated mercy seat, but it wasn't a seat for God to sit because he was enthroned up in the air, hovering above the cherubim in his glory cloud. We can see that in the courtyard you have a basin, or a so-called laver, a place from which the priests could draw water to purify themselves before they entered the presence of their king. They were his servants, his house servants. And there was something outside, which was an altar, where he would receive his food in the form of smoke. Now, this is very strange. How could anyone receive food in the form of smoke? This is just one more indication that although this was the palace of a king, he was not just like any ordinary king. He was special. He was God. He didn't sit in a regular way on a seat, on a throne. He didn't receive his food in a regular way, but in the form of smoke, because he was God. He's different from us. Solomon's temple, later on, many centuries later, was a solid structure. It had, like the wilderness sanctuary, an inner, most holy place, and an outer, living room place, 
but it was different. It had solid doors. It had more of these basins in the court. It had more lights. There were quite a few details that were different, but the basic overall structure in terms of the two apartments and the courtyard and the altar were the same. Solomon's temple was also a valid representation on earth of what God's heavenly temple is like up there in the sky. So we can see that you can't take all of those details of the wilderness sanctuary, all the hooks and pins and everything, and derive theological meaning from it, meaning about God and his plan of salvation. Many of those things were practical. They were intended to hold this tent up, keep the roof above the heads of the priests so that it wouldn't fall down on their heads. It was practical. Solomon's temple had differences, but the overall idea was the same. God's heavenly temple, of course, is so much greater. And it's much more vast and high and wide and glorious. And yet these earthly temples, even the glorious temple of Solomon, although it was just a faint shadow, was a way of indicating the contours of God's heavenly temple so that we can understand his plan of salvation. And much more important than understanding the physical structure is to understand the drama of what's taking place there. The drama of the ages as Jesus, the desire of ages, is carrying out our plan of salvation. The Temple of Solomon was at the high point of the city of Jerusalem, and you can see that from this picture. It overlooked the entire uh, rest of the city. It was on Mount Moriah, the place where Abraham was about to sacrifice his son Isaac when he offered a substitute, a ram, when God called to him and told him, don't offer your son. This was the same place, this temple, where David experienced the destroying angel who had already destroyed 70,000 of his people. And David cried out for mercy, and David was allowed to offer sacrifices, according to 2 Samuel chapter 24. So this place where animal sacrifices were offered was a place of ransom for human life. That's what the sanctuary, and that's what the temple was all about. Ransom for human life because of sacrifices that pointed forward to Jesus' sacrifice, which is the ultimate ransom for human life. Now, in the time of Jesus, Solomon's temple was long gone, but Herod had rebuilt the second temple that was built after the exile. He had rebuilt this temple into a magnificent structure. And we're told that the pinnacle of the temple was about 217 feet high. There was a massive courtyard, and it was a beautiful structure, which Jesus and his disciples managed to, to look at. And they, they marveled at when they were looking at it from the Mount of Olives. On this site today, if you go to Jerusalem, that temple, of course, was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. But on that spot, at the Temple Mount, there is an Islamic shrine, which is a shrine commemorating a special event in the life of Muhammad on that very same place there. It's a beautiful structure, not as, uh, as grand, perhaps, as some of the earlier ones that we've been talking about, but it's still a very magnificent structure. And if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of where the temple is and um, where it is uh, headquartered. Of course, below the Mount of Olives, but still on Mount Moriah, which is the high point of the uh, city of Jerusalem in the time of David and Solomon. Now let's go back to the sanctuary of the wilderness period and look at the meaning of its different parts. The sanctuary is all about Christ. We have indications from the Bible that the animal sacrifices represent Christ. John the Baptist introduced Jesus for the very first time. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The priests represent Christ explicitly in the book of Hebrews. The veil, according to Hebrews 10, represents Christ's flesh. And by his being broken, we have access to the presence of God. God's law is based upon love. And the representation of his law is written on the Ten Commandments as examples of his law of love. And those Ten Commandments were placed in the ark inside the Holy of Holies, and God was enthroned above that because his government is founded upon that law of love. Christ, of course, being God, is love because God is love. And so he's represented by that law of love, representing his character right there in the sanctuary.
The bread of the presence on the golden table in God's living room represents Christ, the bread of life, the light from the lamps. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The water from the basin, Jesus said, I am the living water. The incense that goes up to heaven with the, the merits of Christ's intercession for us, this represents Christ. The outer altar, of course, is representing the cross of sacrifice. The cross was Jesus' altar, and in the book of Hebrews it says that we have an altar from which others don't have a right to eat. We who believe in Jesus and his sacrifice. So this passage links the cross with the altar, as you can see from the cover of this DVD and from the cover of my book, Altar Call. Now let's look at the bread of the presence. We'll zero in on this one particular element. This bread was changed every Sabbath. Why every Sabbath? It was placed there anew. The Sabbath, of course, is the memorial of creation, according to various passages of Scripture. This indicates that the bread, basic food, sustaining life, is representing the fact that God, as the resident creator, provider, is dwelling in the midst of his people. They gave him bread. But whereas other ancient Near Eastern peoples fed their deities because the gods needed food, for God, it wasn't that way. He didn't need our human food. But this was a token to him to acknowledge that, in fact, he feeds them. The bread offering consisted of 12 loaves in six piles. It, that is to, to say, six loaves in two piles each. And this bread offering represented the covenant between God and his people Israel. How many tribes were there? How many tribes? 12 tribes, 12 loaves of bread. So this was an eternal covenant between God and his people. This bread was eaten by the priests. God didn't eat any of the bread. Although it was offered to him, he assigned it to the priests, and the only part that he got was the incense on top that he was able to smell. But none of the food proper was consumed by God, because God doesn't need our food, according to Psalm 50. The sanctuary is all about Christ. And you can see in this picture, you can see the two piles of six loaves of bread each, total of 12 loaves. You can see also in this picture other elements. You have incense and light. So let's turn to the incense. There's a connection between incense and making smoke of sacrifices. When the priest, according to Leviticus, burned a sacrifice on the altar, the verb for this is hiktir from the same root as the Hebrew noun, katorit. Can you hear the similarity? The root is katar. Katorit, and the verb is hiktir. So that means that the priest was making incense, in a sense, making smoke when he burned up that sacrifice on the altar. He wasn't just burning it up. He was sending it up vertically to God's heavenly residence, connecting the earthly sanctuary with heaven. According to Numbers chapter 16, incense can provide atonement. When there was a plague, when the people had rebelled against God, Moses told Aaron, take your incense and go among the people. And he stood between the living and the dead. Where his incense went, there was life. Where he didn't make it, there was death. So incense can provide atonement and ransom for life. Atonement is a life and death matter. And we can see that this priestly intercession made a difference. And when we pray, for other people. And we, as a priesthood of all believers, pray to God in intercession for others. And the incense of Christ's sacrifice goes up with that intercession. It makes a difference. It's powerful. And people live whereas they would die otherwise. In heaven, we find in the book of Revelation, another angel with a golden censer came. Now you realize that sometimes Jesus Christ is represented as an angel because the word angel, both in Hebrew and in Greek, means messenger. Sometimes that special messenger is Christ. So this could be Christ here. Another angel with a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given a great quantity of incense to offer with the prayers of the saints on the golden altar that is before the throne. And this is the throne of God. This is special. Jesus Christ uh, merits his incense from his sacrifice, goes up accompanying our prayers 
Without the sacrifice of Christ, God would not even have to listen to our prayers because we are sinful, faulty, mortal human beings. And yet Christ's sacrifice, incense, goes up with those prayers to make those prayers sweet before God. That's a wonderful thing. Now let's look at the lamps. The lamps were the light inside the sanctuary. This light was on all night. It burned continually from the evening until the morning. Now this shows that this had to be a divine being. Now some of us, of course, keep our lights on all night if we're working hard on a project, but this was every single night of every day of every year. God's light was on because he doesn't need sleep. And that's what it says in Psalm 121, that he who watches over Israel doesn't slumber or sleep. You know what that means to you? That means that God, your guardian, your protector, is always there to protect you and take care of you. If you were an Israelite child and you were afraid, you're out there in the wilderness living in your tent, there could be enemies out there, there could be poisonous snakes, there could be various things, and you got scared in the middle of the night and you lifted up the tent flap and you looked over towards the sanctuary, guess what you would see? You would see that there's a light on in God's house because he is looking out for you. Not only that, his light was in his glory cloud up above. This was a light for divine guidance and protection. Light in the Bible is also a symbol of God's word or communication, a lamp to our feet, a light to our path so that we do not stumble. In John chapter 1, we find Christ's life is a light that lightens everyone who comes into the world. It doesn't matter what your background is, Christ's life lightens you, even if you don't know his name. He is able to enlighten you through his spirit, through his influence in the world, leading you to himself, if you will only come. Christ's dwelling on earth as God dwelt in the sanctuary was uh, very much connecting God with human beings. You see, Jesus spoke of himself as being like a temple. If you destroy this temple, speaking of his body, I will raise it up. So Christ is a temple dwelling on earth. And in John 1, chapter 14, it says that the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us is the same as the light who lightens everyone who comes into the world. That Word that became flesh and dwelt among us is Christ. He is the Word, the communication from God. And He came and dwelt, but the Greek word means tabernacled. It's the same as the Word that's used in Exodus 25, verse 8, in the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, that says, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Here in John 1, 14, Christ dwells among us as flesh. It's the same word, as a temple among us. He's the greater revelation, the greater presence of God with us. Christ is the light of world of the world, giving the light of life. He's so much greater than those ancient lamps in the Israelite sanctuary. We need a continual source of power to keep the light going. When the power goes off, the lights go off. In the Israelite sanctuary, there had to be a way to keep the lights going. And this was oil that had to be brought by the people, according to Leviticus 24. But the solution to this problem of how to maintain a continuous flow of oil shows up in Zechariah chapter 4, in a vision to the prophet Zechariah. And here you have olive trees with pipes running directly right into the lampstand to provide a continual living flow of oil. And then verse 6 of Zechariah says, uh, Zechariah 4 says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. So that oil, that power for light, is representing the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit provides illumination, teaching and guidance, and power to witness. When we don't have that power, there's a problem. But each Spirit-filled Christian is like a lamp. And Jesus said, let your light so shine before men. We don't have any light in and of ourselves. We need that oil of the Holy Spirit. Each church community is like a lampstand. And in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus Christ, the glorified Lord after he ascends to heaven, comes and ministers 
among the lampstands representing the seven churches, God's people on earth. Every church community is like a lampstand. We must be connected to the Spirit who pours love into our hearts. And we'll talk more about that. Romans 5, verse 5. This is the light that lightens the world. The love of Christ poured into us through the Holy Spirit. If we become unplugged by forsaking our first love, by getting disconnected from the Holy Spirit, this source of love and life and holiness, we're disconnected from Christ. And then we lose our light and other people can't find the way to God and they will stumble and we will stumble. So we need to stay connected. We need to stay drinking in that Holy Spirit so that we can have that light that points to Christ. Now the light had to not only have a, a, a flow of oil to keep it going, it had to be shining in the right direction so that it would do some good. In Numbers chapter 8, the sanctuary lamps were directed forward into the open part of the sanctuary, not off into some corner, because the priests needed light. Similarly, Jesus told his followers to shine so that their light benefits others. Don't just cover up your light under a bushel. Shine it out. Let it out. And the point is, their light is good deeds, which come from cooperation with God, to show the way to the divine source of all. This isn't to show how they can save themselves by their own works. It's to show how God's power through His Spirit is able to transform them, to make them a different kind of people, more loving people, so that His way of love can then extend out as an influence into the world and people can follow that uh, light and find Him as the source of all. It's a tracer to lead them to God. Now, in the courtyard of the sanctuary, there was the laver, as I mentioned, the basin, which the priests would use the water to purify their hands and feet before they could officiate. And there was also the altar. This altar was a place of animal sacrifice. And let's talk about the origin of animal sacrifice for a moment. When Adam and Eve sinned, it was necessary for them to be redeemed. You see, the problem was... They had broken the law of love. Love is the only principle on the basis of which intelligent beings with free choice can get along without destroying each other. So if you break the law of love, you can't exist in God's universe. The point isn't death so much as it is non-existence. And so Adam and Eve were condemned by this law of love that they had broken. They had been unloving to their creator God, who had given them a dream world, everything that they could imagine, and given them each other. They broke that law of love, so they had to die. But the very law of love that condemned them to death was the same motivating principle in the heart of God that said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The very same law that condemned them was the same principle that made God want to redeem them and save them so that they could live. So God had a catch-22, a massive problem on His hands. What was he going to do about that? The answer is sacrifice. Now you say, why sacrifice? Why couldn't God have just said to Adam and Eve, well, look here, Adam and Eve, you've really hurt me badly, but just go and don't do it again and we'll forget about this whole thing. See, that would be mercy. But that mercy would not be fair. It would compromise the law of love in the universe because love includes justice as well as mercy. And justice said that they had to die. So the answer was, Jesus Christ, who is God, he is the law, because the law is simply the character of God, would die in the place of Adam and Eve. For them to understand this future coming sacrifice, God had human beings slay animals. These animals had been their pets. Adam and Eve were given dominion over all the creatures of the earth. They belonged to them. Now they had to take one of these precious creatures and they had to take its life, showing that sin has life and death consequences because when you break the law of love, you can't live anymore in God's universe. The patriarchs continued this custom of sacrifices, pointing forward to Christ's sacrifice. They would burn a whole animal on the altar and that was their worship to God as that smoke went up to God in heaven. In reality, the sacrifice was given to God 
But when they gave that animal of theirs, that was just a token acknowledgement by which they received the greater sacrifice of Christ, the atonement that he was giving, as a free gift. In the Israelite sanctuary, the offerer didn't do all of the rituals, all of the actions connected with each of those sacrifices. The offerer came and had to take the life of his own animal, slit the throat, so that the animal would pass out and die with a minimum of pain, so it was quite humane, nothing like Christ's sacrifice. And then the priests would collect the blood. You can see the priest there on the left collecting that blood. And then the priest had to do everything connected with the altar. The priest had to take the blood and dash it against the sides of the altar in a burnt offering. And then the offerer would have to skin the animal and cut the animal in parts, and the priest would put those parts on the altar. This is according to Leviticus chapter 1. We see here that we have priests as servants of God carrying out ministry on behalf of his people. Let's look at several of these kinds of sacrifices and see the main points. We start with the burnt offering. This burnt offering consisted of a series of activities. So it was an activity system. A human activity system like that has a goal. When you got up this morning, you had a group of habits and a routine that you do, right? Got out of bed and maybe you wash your face, maybe you brush your teeth, and then you put your clothes on and, and so on. And there's, there's a habit, there's a system. And the goal is to get ready for the day's activities. But these sacrifices, you had to do the different actions in a certain order and you couldn't leave anything out. It's like when you log on to the internet. There's a certain protocol. You have to do all of those actions in a certain way in order to accomplish the goal that you want. Each of these sacrifices was a transaction between the human party and God. The human party gave a token food gift to God, and then God gave the much greater gift of atonement. So there was a transaction, which is an exchange of value. In this burnt offering, God takes a token food gift. This word in Leviticus 1 verse 9, that's usually translated offering by fire. It's related to fire according to most translations. That translation doesn't really work very well because that word appears in places where it's not burned. Furthermore, it appear, the word doesn't appear in other places where you would expect it. The word most likely means gift. Most likely not derived from the idea of fire at all. We find later in Numbers 28, for example, that these sacrifices, in fact, were food for the Lord. It's like when you have hospitality for someone, like when Abraham entertained angels underwears, and he gave them gifts of food for hospitality, and then one of them turned out to be the Lord himself. That's what this was about, communing with God, giving him a gift, and then receiving something much greater in exchange. This food gift had to be accepted by the Lord. If it didn't, the transaction was not complete. The greater benefit that God gave was called, in Hebrew, kiper, which is usually translated atone. But what it really means is to remove an impediment, an obstruction, something that gets in the way of the relationship between God and his people. There were various parts to the burnt offering. The first one was leaning one hand on the head of the animal. By leaning the hand on the head of the animal, the person identified himself or herself as the owner of the animal. That is, the one who was giving over the animal to God. It's like when you sign your name on the title or the pink slip of a car when you're selling it. You're saying, I'm the owner, that is, I'm the transferring owner who has the right to give this over. This meant, when the person did that, that this was their offering. So even if somebody else, maybe their child, if they were old perhaps or feeble, uh, whoever led the offering into the courtyard was not necessarily the one who was the offerer. The offerer was the one who leaned one hand on the head of that animal. Then the blood was applied to the altar. None of the blood went up in the smoke to God because it was a kosher food gift. Remember that God didn't allow his people to eat meat from which the blood wasn't drained at the time of slaughter. And so God practiced what he preached. He was an example to them. And although he could have consumed that blood, because he's the creator, he didn't as an example to them. 
just as Christ was baptized as an example to us, even though he didn't need purification from sin. So this blood was not only drained out to show respect for life that belongs alone to the Creator, it was also applied to the altar. And God explains in Leviticus 17, verse 11, that the blood is applied to the altar, and God assigned it that function in order to ransom your lives. The translations say to atone your lives, but with the expression your lives, it means ransom. Instead of you dying, this animal dies. And of course we know that this points forward to the much greater, the real, the one and only sacrifice that truly does any good. That is the sacrifice of Christ. But the Israelites were receiving Christ, or receiving his sacrifice by entering into this experience in this powerfully dramatic way that was sobering. It taught them the life and death principles that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, according to the book of Romans. The animal was prepared as a food gift. It was cut up the way uh, Abraham would have cut up an animal, a fatted calf, to give it to his guests. The Part of it was washed in order to get the dung off because off the, the hind legs and from the, from the innards in order to prepare it as a food gift. And then the hide of the animal, which had been taken off the animal, belonged to the priests as his agent's commission because the priests were God's servants. He received the sacrifices as gifts to himself, but then he allotted part of them as his agent's commissions to his priests because they had to live too. They didn't have time to go out and farm and do all the other things that the rest of the Israelites did in order to make a living. They couldn't plow and raise crops and so on and take care of these animals. And so God gave them agents' commissions from the sacrifices that they offered at the sanctuary. Now let's talk about the meaning of the burnt offering for us. We've been talking about the meaning for them. They could receive atonement by offering this token food gift to the Lord. But what about for us living today in the 21st century? This gift to God was often consisting of a lamb, but there were also bulls and there were goats and there were birds, various kinds of other sacrificial animals. And yet, when John the Baptist introduced Jesus for the first time, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why would he refer to him at that crucial moment as a lamb? Why not a bull? Why not the bull of God, the goat of God? There are several possible reasons. One is that in Isaiah 53, the human suffering servant of God is referred to as a lamb. So Jesus Christ fulfills the prophecy of the suffering servant to die for us like a lamb who's led to the slaughter without making a sound. Another thing is that the Passover sacrifice was a lamb, and Christ died as the Passover sacrifice for us. But there's a third reason that's very important, and that is in Numbers chapter 28. The morning and evening burnt offering that was offered every day of the year to cover the Israelites with the atonement of Christ. This was a lamb. It doesn't mean a little tiny baby lamb, but a young sheep about a year old. This was a lamb. So when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, this is like a way to say, this is the foundation of the entire sacrificial system. Here is the one who is fulfilling everything in order to take away the sin of the world. And of course, Jesus' name, according to Matthew 121, he is called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And that's what we need, is salvation from our sins. Christ, in order to do that, has to be an unblemished sacrifice. Just as the animals in ancient Israel had to be unblemished. They didn't have uh, major defects. There were certain things that they couldn't have. They couldn't be crippled, and they had to be all there, and they... Christ, however, it wasn't just a matter of being physically unblemished. Christ is morally unblemished. According to Hebrews 4, 15, 4 verse 15, Christ was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. See, if he had sinned, he would have been in need of a Savior. He would have had to have someone die for him. But he can die for us as our substitute because of the fact 
that he is morally unblemished. What about the leaning one hand on the head of the animal? What could that possibly signify that could be of benefit to us? We see in Isaiah 53, verse 4, that it says there of God's suffering servant, this lamb, surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. He carries the weight of our faultiness, our sin, upon him. Christ's blood ransoms, redeems, frees us from debt, according to the Bible. You can regard this as a kind of a legal symbolism, a legal metaphor. By legal, we really mean relational. When we sin, there's a problem there that has to be taken care of. Something that means that I should no longer get to live in God's universe. And when Christ died, his blood ransoms me, his life for my life, him in place of me, so that I don't have to die. He died in place of every one of us, even though he didn't have to. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, Him who knew no sin became sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's very powerful. He became sin. And in John 3, speaking to Nicodemus, Jesus said that the Son of Man must be lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Serpent, what does that make you think of? Makes you think of the serpent way back there in Genesis. The one who led Adam and Eve into sin. The serpent who was used by Satan. So as Jesus Christ is lifted up on the cross, it is as though he has become the personification of all evil. He absorbs every bit of lust and cruelty and, and anger and every sin imaginable of all of human history. He absorbed it into himself. So that having done that, he could allow himself to be destroyed and with that, destroy all evil. That's incredibly powerful. As such, Christ's human life was consumed. He was offered up. All of him was offered up. His divine life, of course, uh, continued because he had the power to lay down his life and to take it up again. But his human life was totally consumed for us. And the suffering that he suffered on the cross was due not to his human part, but because of his divine part. Because God is one, an indissoluble union. Colossians 1.19 and 2.9 say that Christ is the pleroma, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So when our sin was laid upon him and he became sin, the Godhead, the deity, the trinity was wrenched apart, causing infinite suffering. It's like an atomic blast. The atom shouldn't be split. But if it is split, it unleashes energy and suffering if it's in the form of a bomb. This offering was consumed completely, and it was God's gift to us. It wasn't our gift to him. It's like when I was a child, seven years old. My parents brought me and my brother to the United States so my father could study right here at Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan in 1962. We were very poor, and that Christmas, all I had to give to my parents was one little dime. One dime, and I wrapped up that tiny dime, and I put it under that little tiny model Christmas tree that we have, because that's all we could afford, and I gave that dime to my parents. And that was my gift to them. But guess where I got that dime from? Where do you think I got it from? I got it from my parents. They had given me that dime. It was just a token. And what it really meant was, not that I was paying them something, but that I loved them. And it was a token of my love and appreciation for them and my trust for them. That's what these sacrifices were. God had given his people everything. And by returning to him just a little token of what he had done, they were expressing love and trust. And that's why the smoke from the sacrifices, which wouldn't have physically smelled very good, went up nevertheless, the Bible describes it, as a pleasing aroma to God. And he smelled it in a sense, in a human way of speaking. It was pleasant because it expressed the sweet love and the faith that his people had as they received his infinitely greater gift of Christ's sacrifice. The burnt offering, the Hebrew word for burnt offering is olah, which means ascending, because it ascended up in smoke to God for his acceptance, according to Leviticus 1 verse 9. 
Christ ascended to heaven after his resurrection in order to receive acceptance from his father. And he said to Mary Magdalene in the garden, after he had been raised from the dead, he said, don't hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. He needed to ascend to his father for acceptance, just as the burnt offering went up in smoke. And imagine this, his sacrifice was not yet completed. He had died, he had been raised from the dead, but he hadn't yet gone up in smoke to complete that great transaction, the most important event in human history, and yet he interrupted it, turned aside, like the Good Samaritan, to comfort one distraught, discouraged human being, Mary Magdalene, the only person who had truly understood that he came to this world to save sinners because he had saved her. He turned aside, not like the priest and the Levite in the story of the Good Samaritan, who went on their way without wanting to touch a dead body lest they should defile themselves and be disqualified from going to the sanctuary, to the temple, to offer sacrifices that were the mere shadow of the real thing. Christ was doing the real thing, and yet he interrupted as the ultimate Good Samaritan to comfort this one person. And then he told her, Take the good news. Go tell your brothers, the disciples, and Mary Magdalene. That sinner who was redeemed by Jesus became the very first evangelist because evangelism refers to good news. And she carried the good news of the resurrection, the very first one. So if you ever doubt that God loves you, remember what he has done. He not, not only is concerned about gaining legal justification for you by what he's done, he cares about your feelings. He wants to redeem you as a whole human being. And this is demonstrated by what he did on the cross and then how he turned aside and he comforted Mary. This is the magnificent message of the sanctuary and Jesus Christ. This is what it's all about. It's not just about a building. It's about a person. That person is our Savior. He invites us to come to his sanctuary, which is truly a place of sanctuary a place of guidance and comfort and protection for all time, not just for now, not just for this life, but for eternal life. I'd like to thank you for watching the first presentation of our four-part series. The series is called Altar Call, and that first section was called A Place of Sanctuary. The next presentation is called A Diamond That Is Forever. And I invite you to watch that to find out why there's a diamond and why it's forever.